Steve from FX Pedal Planet, thank you for joining us today. And today we've got the uh, fantastically talented uh, jazz guitarist, singer, songwriter, uh, Kate Schutt. Kate, Hi guys. Say hello. <laughs> hey there. Hey Steve. So happy to be here. Just oh, thrilled. Yeah. Just thank you very much for joining us. It's it's yeah. an absolute pleasure to have you here. That really is so. Can't um, wait. Can't wait. Yeah, as I said to you earlier on, I've been looking and listening to a lot of your music and, and it's beautiful and the songwriting is just mm. so nice. Have you Thank always you. had that uh, gift, if you like? Uh, I've always had the interest in songs and songwriting. Um, when I, I first picked up the guitar when I was uh, 11 or 12 it's hard to i can't really remember i started piano first piano was my first instrument but then very soon after that i i wanted to play the guitar because there were a bunch of boys in my class um at school who were playing the guitar and i was like i can do that <laughs> um, <laughs> uh so i picked it up and then very shortly after that i started a band or i was in a band i don't know how it started but we all we all came together and started a true garage band we would practice in my friend's garage on the weekends. And, um, you know, after we had learned a handful of Jimi Hendrix and Grateful Dead and uh, who else? Janis Joplin tunes, like classic rock. There's some it good was, artists there. Yeah, yeah. We were, we were really into classic rock. Um, after we learned all that, we... Um, we decided to start writing songs. So that's really where it came from was just like my band and I and all of us writing our first song together, kind of co-writing it, um, which was, you know, and from there, it was always something that interested me. I mean, I love songs. Songs were my life. Like songs were songs. Songs were my I have two older brothers and I'm the younger you know, I'm the youngest and the baby sister. So like most brothers, the older brother, like, like most brothers, they didn't really want me around much as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's where I got the classic rock from, you know, they were listening to that kind of stuff. And, um, but I remember somehow, this is in the era of cassette tapes. I remember it very well. You remember it? I okay. remember it very well. <laughs> Cassette tapes. Um, I had a Smurf Walkman, which is like what I wanted most desperately for my birthday one year, about 12 or 13 years old. And I got it. Thank God. And um, I found this tape that didn't have any uh, writing on it. Like, you know, you used to make tapes for friends and, and right. make, make mixes and stuff. That's and right. this tape... Yeah, this tape had no markings on it. It was clearly like something somebody had dubbed for one of my brothers. So I put it in my Walkman and I just was totally mesmerized. And I never knew who it was. And I didn't, I think I was too scared to ask my brothers, probably because I was not supposed to have it, you know? Um, <laughs> so I uh, come to find out like years later, that tape was the Rick, it was a Ricky Lee Jones tape of that. I don't, I don't now remember, know what record that was, but like, of course, kind of that breakout record of hers with um, Chucky's in Love on it. And man, I just, I just loved that thing. I just loved that album. And you know, those songs are so beguiling and the groove is so fantastic. And the, if you go back and look at who's playing on those records and, that was it. I think I was, I was pretty much, you know. Yeah, I've, I've read as well about a, a, a story that uh, you were influenced as well by Tina Turner as well. Uh, yeah, the Smurf Walkman plays a, plays a part in that story too. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Private Dancer record came out when I was 10 years old. So um, I got that tape and put it into my, my Smurf Walkman and just proceeded to wear that thing out. I mean, I just loved Tina. I still love Tina. Um, I mean, I've seen her in concert pretty much every time you can see her in concert, every time she's been on mm -hmm. tour. On her last tour, I saw her a handful of times. Like, you know, I saw her here in New York twice. I went out to L.A. to see her. and um, She's pretty special, isn't she? 
Yeah, she's amazing. She's uh, special. Yeah, I mean, just the energy, just the energy and the um, that voice. I mean, it's such an iconic voice. Not to mention, you know, the dancing, the legs, the whole show, the show. Well, that's um, it, isn't it. If if you were if you were going to have uh, be sung to or going to a, a Tina Turner concert or Tina Turner Tina Turner's going on TV, you just knew that it was going to be. You was going to be in for something special. Totally. You know. Totally. Her shows are masterful. I don't know. Um, I I repeatedly watch before I go on stage uh, one of her live shows. Um, and, you know, I mean, just the way it's crafted. And, 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 you know, like, you could say, like, what does a singer-songwriter who, generally speaking, performs solo, you know, um have to do like what what can i get 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 from watching a huge arena show over and over again but you know there's so many aspects of that that are translatable to your own show um for example like in her last um in her last big tour they they did this part in the middle where okay you know hits 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 like electric fireworks dancers all the whole thing and then in the middle of the show they all they brought it all into the middle and they all played acoustically she sat on a stool yeah, yeah it was like this totally intimate moment in the midst of this you know two-hour bonanza of energy but of course, it's just brilliant, right? Because you can't go two hours at like top volume, energy wise, like you just can't. And so she brought it down and then it just like refreshes your palate as the watcher and the experiencer of this thing. So that then like the second half was just like, yeah. it was amazing. Phenomenal. Was amazing. So just, yeah. yeah, phenomenal. Uh, and and, and as, as it happens, Private Dancer was written by one of my favorite guitarist uh, Martin Opfler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I know. Amazing, right? Like, he, amazing. He gave that song to her. And uh, mm -hmm. and it's it's strange that uh, when I found that out, when I'd been listening to Private Dancer for many years, and right. I actually found out that it was written by Martin Opfler. And it was around the time of his Love Over Gold album. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I can just tell the songwriting. And, and when I found out, I was like, oh, yeah, that's it, it's so obvious. You know, it's at that totally. time when uh, Mark was writing Love Over Gold album and the songwriting was just the same. So uh, mm -hmm. I know great. that. And there's that's so it's so true. Like, you know, I think she she has this ability with that voice. I mean, you take a song like Simply the Best, like if you actually look at that song, you know, if you if I read to you the lyrics off a page, you'd be like, boo, <laughs> like, we, you know, like, boo, <laughs> like, or I would, you know, as as the kind of songwriter I am. And then but then you hear it and like, you can't help but just be fired up when you hear that song, you know. So, so what, what, what other uh, artists have you been inspired uh, by? Oh, man. Well, I think, I mean, my favorite songwriter is Cole Porter. Um, I'm always trying to write a song that sounds like a Cole, like a lost Cole Porter song or a Cole Porter song that was written in the 21st century by a female, you know. Um, so it's that's he's sort of my my songwriting hero. And and as I as I revealed to you, you know, my first musical experiences besides piano, which was much very classically based, um, were classic rock. So you kind of, you can take the, the girl out of classic rock, but you can't take the classic rock out of the girl. So as I say, it, you know, it's, I'm, I'm very cognizant of the fact that when I say I, Cole Porter is my musical hero, like I'm always trying to write those kinds of songs and you'll then always hear sort of these really pop kind of rock things come out in my writing and playing because that just was in there before, you know, very, it was the very first thing that was imprinted on me, really. Yeah. yeah um, the, 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 from listening to your albums, and we'll, we'll talk about your albums next, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. 
I mean, there's obviously a very big jazz, jazz influence, but mm -hmm. there's there's other bits coming into it as well. It's not just all sort of pure jazz, you know. Mm -hmm. there's, there's something for everyone, really. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's really big. Like I said, because I came. I mean, my parents had the double album of Ella Fitzgerald sings the Cole Porter songbook, like a record. Those there was a two record thing, and so that was constantly playing in my house. Um, but like I said, you know, I was listening over and over to Ricky Lee Jones and um, Tony Childs and some some other songwriters like that that are, you know, um, really, really. We're, we're in there early, so. And I came to jazz, I came to studying jazz later in my life. Actually, my guitar teacher from my the very beginning of my life, um, John Darty, he's uh, passed away about a decade ago now. Um, he was a great bebop guitar player, and he was like my first guitar player. Guitar teacher, sorry. He was my very first guitar teacher. So, and I studied with him from the time I was 11 to basically through Berkeley College of Music. Um, Cause when I moved to Boston to go to Harvard and then dropped out to go to Berkeley, John moved to Boston too. So we just kept studying. And so I had all this like knowledge of jazz and it was in there, but I didn't really study it like seriously until I, until I went to Berkeley. Well, so it was like, it was all in there and, and, um, you know, but that's, I think, to answer your question or to comment on why there's so many other, so many other things in my music. Yeah, well, it sounds like it was always kind of in there and it just, it was just waiting to come out and, you know, and here we are. Mm -hmm. But uh, you've got a number of albums out, one of them quite recently, which is mm -hmm. Right Nowhere. Mm -hmm. And then you've got two albums as well, uh, No Love Lost and Telephone Game. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um if you'd like to tell us about those albums and how sure. the songwriting came from, um, I mean, starting with the, was it No Love Lost was your first? Well, actually, I have a whole bunch of records that um, came out before that that are, if you if you go down some rabbit holes on the internet, you might be able to buy. Um, there was a there was a three album sort of trilogy called um, Broken Wing Trick, Broken World, and Broken, um, and then there were a whole bunch of records I made kind of uh just very small runs like 500 pressing or less with like handmade covers and stuff like that so you can find those but i i kind of say that no love lost was my for first big like studio effort yeah. um and uh yeah i mean that that record really was uh um made with the sound of gypsy jazz in my head um, I had, I was living in Canada at the time and, um, had heard a fantastic Newfoundland guitarist named Dwayne Andrews and his, his buddy, um, uh, Patrick Boyle play. And, um, I was just enamored of their sound. Right. And I was, I had been, I had, um, had a, I had had a bunch of these songs written and with a co-writer, um, Jesse Ruddock and, uh, you know, we, I'd had these songs written and I was sort of looking for the, um, the sound of them to, to be recorded and I hadn't found it yet. And then I heard Dwayne and I was like, that's it. And so we made that record sort of over a, a little bit of time, um. And uh, I guess the track from that one, that record that that I would point to, is a track called "Wrecking Ball," which is which is a really fun track and sort of um, representative of that of that album, yeah. or "How Much in Love," that song. Um, and then uh, right after that, I made the Telephone Game record, uh, and that again I made in Canada, um, but I but I played with a great group of musicians on that record. The really amazing drummer Terry Lynn Carrington um and uh I don't even need to say the word female anymore the, the really great drummer Terry Lynn Carrington <laughs> um Orrin Evans incredible pianist jazz pianist who's who's a hero of mine and um just a, a just a all-star cast of people um uh, and that record was amazing again a really big production 
record. Um, but yeah, really that's got awesome. that big production feel about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And lots of background vocalists and, um, just a, just a, just really fun to make a record that sounded like that, you know? Yeah, I, I bet, you know, because there's so much going on and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it must be wonderful to create something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, and to have those kinds of players, um, you know, to be able to put a band together like that, to make that music mm -hmm. is so exciting and to produce it. And that record I co-produced with Michael Philip Voyevoda and, um, but no love lost. I produced myself and just, you know, just getting into all the details of it. I mean, I think the production stuff really comes out of my interest in arranging um, cause when I was at Berkeley, I did, I, I, I took basically as many arranging classes as I could take. And, um, that's, that's a big love of mine is arranging. Yeah. And so, um, the production stuff comes out of that and just having a vision, you know, really having a vision and knowing that it's possible to get there yeah. if you just stick to the vision and, you know, are flexible. Hmm. Wow. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so what did you so, so the learn the skills that you learned as your producing skills, was that really just, you know, sort of Yeah, it was kind of things like that? Yeah. I mean the those records I mentioned that you can't you've gotta go dig deep to find. I mean, all those were self produced or produced with a really close friend of mine from my days at Berkeley, Leon Lim. Talent, incredibly talented um, production engineer. We were best friends, and um, we did we made those records together. And, and it was really through being with him and making all those records together. Um, and then, you know, and like I said, and just just then all the all the experience arranging, and also, I mean, p having played a million gigs, you know, like mm -hmm. playing live is. You're working, you are a producer of your song, of your show, you know, and um, I think a lot of it has to do with that too. And mm. and just being, like I said, very clear about what, what sound I wanted mm. and then going and finding the best players mm. for that sound. And, you know, one of the great things about jazz is that, um, or having that body of knowledge is the knowledge that, those players um, can do anything, you know, like that's, that's part of the reason why I love jazz and why I study it so seriously still is that it's, you know, you, you, you study so hard and you know so much and you work so hard to get all of that under your fingers so you can play it all. And so I, I know when hiring a person like Terry Lynn or Orrin Evans or John Ellis, who did all the saxophone parts and did all the horn arranging, you know, like they're going to be able to get you any sound you want. Mm. They're such master musicians.